Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and by popular demand, I'm delighted again to be able to speak to Paul Scott of Stockopedia, one of the UK's finest small and micro cap investors. So, welcome, Paul. Thanks, Paul, for lovely introduction. You say that to everyone by popular demand. <laughs> yeah, hey, you've had a tremendous year. We'll come on to that later on in the uh, in, in in the chat. But uh, given that sort of like inflation's now finally sort of cooling, and central banks are indicating that they're on hold with their interest rates. Uh, what's your sort of outlook for uh, equities, particularly in your sweet spot of small and micro caps for 2024? Well, I think we've seen huge rallies in some of the overseas markets, haven't we? Particularly uh, America. Uh, I mean, I don't really look at that many um, international markets, but as as predictably, um, UK small caps are still mired in uh, this, this bear market, aren't they? So for me, that just increases the opportunity. Um, and, um, you know, everybody's depressed about UK small caps, but the valuation disparity between international markets and even UK large caps just gets bigger and bigger, which to me is a bigger and bigger opportunity for us. So, um, as you say, really, the, 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 the America seems to be betting on um, the Fed um, uh, um, reducing interest rates in the new year, doesn't it? I mean, I don't really think the Bank of England knows what it's doing. I think they're very much sort of just <laughs> just nothing like following... a bit of confidence in our in our big yeah, monetary no, leader I mean... there, Andrew Bailey, down at uh, the Bank of England. Well, exactly. I mean, they just seem to be in in the Fed slipstream, so don't they? So I can't work out any reason why the UK would drop interest rates, other than that it just ends up copying the Fed, which is what it does in the, in the in the past anyway. So it, it's all above my pay grade, really. I'm just sticking to the to the to the UK small caps, where I see such exceptional value that I'm just totally focused on that. And all these takeover bids coming through mm -hmm. confirms that the UK small caps and mid caps are cheap. So, um, and inflation, as you rightly say, should be down to getting back to the actual question. <laughs> yeah. Should be um, the OBR says it's going to be down to two point eight percent by the end of this year, I think, isn't it? Not next year. Am I? Is that right? No, I think it's next year. I think oh, we're still, year? I think oh, we're still oh, running sure, at about sorry. five percent at the moment. Yeah, but it's probably going to drop a bit. A bit. A oh, bit it will. Yeah. In the, yeah. Sorry, I got that wrong. No, next year, not this year. But then you've got these sort of nine point eight percent and eight point something percent rises in benefits in living wage and in pensions all from april 2024 which is going to be well well a long way above inflation by the time those rises coming in so i'm actually i think in april next year you've got a really big trigger um for disposable net incomes household incomes shooting up mm. so i think you know really uh paradoxically retail and hospitality could be quite interesting sectors to take a fresh look at yeah, well, we'll come on to some of those individual stocks uh, later on. But uh, just on that M and A, when you raised, etc. Not only is the sort of like there's been a splurge of M and A, and and you've you've been a real beneficiary this year. So big pat on the back there, Paul. But uh, it's luck. Well, it's luck. Isn't no, it? no, 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 no. It's I'll give you a bit of skill there. But um, <laughs> but but certainly um, the splurge sort of like suggests to me that they're getting the timing. Be, you know that they, they, they can see small caps rising next year and that's why you're getting an acceleration of the amount of m a not only you're getting you've had a lot this year because of undervaluation but i'm just thinking about timing does that i know it's difficult to say but have we reached the bottom and sort of like other triggers to get this going because i did look at uh it was a, it was a chart on stock on uh, on um uh, when we went down to Mellow last last week, and the mean reversion trade from UK, we're still only sort of five or ten percent above the all time about the three year lows, whereas yes. America is is thirty to fifty percent depending on which index you look at above the lows, etc. So we've got a big catch up trade. So we're just coming Ooh. back to that sort of roundabout way. What's the sort of timing for sort of small caps to recover? Because it, it seems that the M and A boys reckon it's sooner rather than later hence the big sort of pickup big spike in the deals that, that that logic of what you're what you're saying absolutely stacks up doesn't it although i'm not really plugged in particularly to m a specialists mm. uh, in the industry so i don't I, in all honesty i don't know what the industry is actually thinking but it does make sense doesn't it and i think where are we with the overall uk small caps i get the feeling that there are still stale sellers in the market in mm. some shares 
Um, so it's particularly interesting, like, for example, when you see an RNS coming out in a particular company like Sanderson Design was a good example this morning, uh, where uh, an existing in institution has clearly taken out another institution. Someone's gone up from, I think, Close Brothers or somebody went from 5% to 10%. So that's a good sign, isn't it, that you mm. are getting now some institutional buying. And I think just on a stock by stock basis, it's largely random when the sellers run out. Yeah, yeah, I, so I would that's agree. Why uh, that's why I don't know. I don't know when the market turn will happen, but I'm totally convinced we're at or near the low, but simply because, you know, you, it's just a dislocation of the UK small caps market where, you, <clears throat> excuse me, where you've just got uh, irrational sellers who are having to sell either through panic or through redemptions when they're fund managers, and we just have to. The market just has to clear those people out. And it's, it's just on a stock by stock basis when that happens. You won't necessarily know because there are so many institutions between zero and 3% who don't disclose anything unless there's a bid, of course. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, it's like it's like anything. The, the, prop, the solution to low prices is low prices, isn't it? It just, it just attracts buyers yeah. and eventually the buyers um, overcome the sellers. Then you get all the momentum traders coming back in. And this is why I want to be fully invested right now because when the turn happens in some of these stocks they can go 30 percent up you know in the blink of an eye and if you're out of the market for the or you get a bid at a 50 or 100 percent premium if you're yeah. out of the market you'll miss those those uh, uh that upside i think yeah no very wise words better to be early than late that's for sure and, mm, and yes, think about, i think the consensus view certainly when i was down at mellow last week i don't know if you got the same was from professional investors actually they're pretty bullish in smaller micro caps for 2024 in fact I, I must have spoken to about 20 of them and not one of them said they were all going to cash <laughs> that's what i found as well i think it's it's which is scary when it's this unanimous yeah that true small, uk uk small caps are cheap maybe we're missing something <laughs> well, well let's be clear no. about we we'll put it in the context that it's been a really tough two years or well, two and a half yes. years since the top in you know, mid 2021 i think it was and just coming now to sort of your portfolio just take us through sort of like sort of what returns have you made this year because you've obviously been in the right spots and you've done really really well yeah well i don't want to give out the number because it's, it's scary just, it's embarrassing to be honest i don't want people to sort of hate me but you know, no, 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 very... no, no we'll give you a pat on the back i mean let's be clear about it it's just you know you, you've got to look at it over a longer period because you had a tough 2022 yeah. And exactly. Now it so it, back it, a lot. it evens that out, really. And of, of course, I've had a major strategy change that I always emphasize when we do these, that I've, I've completely stopped using my geared accounts. So mm. I just close those accounts and I'm just in the slow lane now, if you like, slow but steady yeah. lane, just buying shares outright. And that, that's much, much more sensible, I think. But yeah, it's been very, very good because I've had um, quite a few takeover bids. And like yourself, I... I do concentrate my portfolio into what I what I think are the best risk reward situations, and and I've had three back to back back to back large percentage winners, which were all the largest position in my portfolio. So it's kind of been a a convergence of of the positive factors. Whereas twenty twenty two was the opposite. Um, you know, my big positions all went wrong. So um, yeah. I think that's an important um, learning point, actually, for investors, because it, you may go through a very fallow period, in fact, extremely painful period. Mm. But as you rightly point out, it can turn quickly. And the point is, don't lose faith at the bottom. If you're doing the right thing, it will turn. Things will get better. I don't know if you want to sort of add to that at all. <laughs> yeah, actually, Richard Staveley, who's very much the man of the moment from Rockwood, strategic mm. who's having a stunning year or a couple of years he put up a very interesting slide at his mellow presentation showing um what happens in the two or three years after each bear market uh, i'm pretty sure it was in small caps or small to mid caps and it showed that regular as clockwork after you've had a nasty drawdown from a bear market the next two or three years are in almost every case, historically, fantastic years for returns. Mm -hmm. And again, it comes back to your point on meme reversion, doesn't it? Mm. So I think those things are very important. Whereas we need to separate out just bad stock picking, don't we? Yeah. You know, yeah. if we've if we if we're just consistently getting stock picks completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing I would add to that, the learnings that I've 
experience over the last couple of years is not getting too obsessed with any one concept or sector mm. um i don't know if you recall but back in 2001 uh, sorry 2021 i think it was i became absolutely convinced all, all the eco e-commerce stocks were going to rebound strongly yeah your asos's and your boohoo's but the thing i but they didn't really mm. um so they didn't the at all people, they went they've gone totally bad they're down about 80%. yeah yeah no it's been <laughs> been hopeless because what i didn't uh pick up on early enough was that the chinese direct to consumer th- companies like Shein yeah. were just bypassing them and and stealing their lunch so <clears throat> that i think is a, is a good learning curve that i just shouldn't have latched onto that concept and then just you know like a dog with a bone refused to let go of it so i'm now i think i've learned to be more flexible now and not to apply one big idea to the market but just to sort of you know look at the evidence looking for ahead of expectations updates yeah. finding overlooked things like that um mm. so yeah all, we're all learning all the time aren't we it's yeah no, absolutely terrific. yeah i mean I, I remember at the start of the year or somewhere i think it might be q1 or q2 but you started to have a, a bit of a a bit of a cold bath and have a good look at all your portfolio and you, i understand yes. you cleaned out didn't you? you you sort of cleared the decks on certain stocks you went through every single one and the and the and the, and the ones yes. you didn't think had you know a great upside you sort of like then monetized it and put it into stocks you do feel as there's a better upside opportunity yeah exactly right i mean with a lot of them i just scaled the position sizes down so mm. i want to keep a sort of foot in the door so i've got about i think it's about 15 or 20 smallish positions but where i you know i get the emails for all the uh, rns's and so on and they're all companies i think are fundamentally good and i want to own but i'm kind of waiting for uh you know some sort of catalyst to make me want to go back in to bigger positions in them so i'm just mm. keeping an open mind on them so it wasn't that i've cleared out the portfolio portfolio as such it's more that i just trimmed everything down yeah. to levels okay. where a profit say say if we haven't had an update for two or three months we don't know how the company's trading other companies in the sector are putting out profit warnings i think there's no harm in that type of situation mm. in just cutting the position size down you know i look at every position and say well how much would it hurt me if it just opened 30 percent down yeah. on a profit warning and if that number scares me then i just think well let, let, let's ease off the mm. ease off the gas a bit yeah um, it's a good discipline it's to... good discipline but you trouble as you do miss out on takeover bids it's like um one of my long-standing value stocks scs uh, sofas um i thought oh nothing ever happens there you know i'll just <laughs> i'll mm. sell 70 or 80 percent of the position size and just sit in there with a, a side holding and you know, i can buy back in any time and bang take over yeah. bid quite a big premium yeah. oh no. God well, I think you might be getting you might you might you might be a bit harsh on yourself there because you'd benefit from on the market and from Seraphine and I think it was best yes. of the best were other ones you've done well this year. So you've had a few yeah. good goals there. Yeah, I mean, on my watch list, which in total was thirty-two stocks, I think there's been six takeover bids, which is fabulous. Is is, is incredible, really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And what so, about yeah. the sort of the benefits in the sort of like the you know the Stockopedia community? Because it's it's important that every sort of professional investor or serious investor has an independent view and reaches their own conclusions. But equally, it's important that you look at different opinions, hopefully in sort of like, <laughs> they're considered views anyway. They're not just criticisms. How do you sort of like treat that balance between reaching your own conclusions and sort of like, you know, getting all the influences? Because you, it's sort of like making sure you, you get the signal, but don't get deflected by the noise. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we're... Um... We very much encourage uh, different views um, when they're well argued and well reasoned. The <laughs> ones that get get up my goat is when somebody just, you know, wants to have a dig at me personally, and so they put up some thing telling me these stocks I hold are rubbish. And, and so, yes, we all uh, we're all guilty of occasionally yeah, losing our rag with those type of posts. Yeah. But no, I mean, generally the stockopedia community, well, almost universally, they're sophisticated investors, mm. um, and you know. Um, the, the reader comments that people put uh, on my daily reports, the small cap value reports, little plug for them there. <laughs> um, people, um, you know, uh, the people are adding value. They're saying, oh, I, yeah. I worked in this sector, so I know them really well. So the reader comments often expand on the kind of conversation starters that me and Graham write, which is mm. precisely what we want. Not Whereas if you go on to some other unregulated bulletin boards, 
it, it's like people are shouting and arguing about their favourite football team. You know, it's yeah. it's, it's pointless. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I, I would agree. I think there's very good educated comments on Stockerpede. In fact, you probably get about 150 every single day, don't you, on your small cap value it's, report? Yeah, it's usually around about 100. And, yeah. you know, nearly all of them add value. The ones we don't like is where people just announce their trade and say, yeah, okay. oh, yes, I quite like this. I bought, I bought some. You think, so what? Yeah. <laughs> but that's very that's very rare other than that yeah the comments are fantastic i mean do you how about you paul i mean do you, do you I, I, I mean any, just i mean genuinely well ge genuinely as an investor i mean you know i i do two things first of all i listen to your weekly podcasts i think they're great and um, you cover you cover a great sort of like summary of of all the major stocks and highlight what you like what you don't like which is fab as as, as exactly how you've designed it as an introduction of a business and what you see mm. the key risks are but also the potential upside which is really top door and then likewise when i run through the comments like like yourself it really adds to the depth of the sort of like the you know the good analysis that you and Graham and, and Roland do so uh, yeah I'm with you Great, <laughs> I guess thanks, the, only, the only the only danger is, is is the signal and the noise concept that that because it, it ends up to be like because it's so successful it ends up to be about a 300 paid report every single day so <laughs> trying to trying to take out but that's where your podcast comes out really well so yeah, Thank I you. think you're doing. I th keep up the great work, Paul. You did a great job. We're all, well, likewise, we're all, I mean, we're everyone... all supporting you. That's for sure. Well, thanks. That's very kind. I appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. And I mean, your um, fund manager interviews in particular are bloody brilliant. I've still, <laughs> I've still got the Richard Staveley one to listen to. I think he ran over two hours there. Didn't yeah, I know he? he was brilliant. He was absolutely fabulous. It's, worth it. it's, yeah, it's, it's great. great content, and you can press pause and come back to it. Yeah. So. I think after this, I'll have a listen to that. When yeah, I, yeah. Uh, anyway, one, one, one which was in the uh, small cap value report today, certainly as a comment, was Plexus because uh, over oh, yes. the weekend, because of COP28, um, uh, President Biden decided and then over the next two years, it was going to ban the flaring of methane and natural gas out of sort of like, you know, oil and gas wells over in the state. So forcing every single oil and gas producer to either cap um, old wells with sort of like you know methane prevention you know sort of like devices or alternatively for any new wells whereby they're not actually extracting any you know methane because it's uncommercial they have to cap that as well to put the you know to put a, a limiter on it so it should in theory given you know it should help the likes of plexus which is the which is a unique uh, business that does oil and gas services it's sort of capping and stopping methane prevention isn't it the elective throw of it yeah, I mean, I should also preface this by saying that Plexus Holdings is my by far my biggest current position. Mm. Um, so I knew about the methane focus um, already. But also, thank you very much for those um, two articles you kindly sent me um, this morning. Very, very interesting. So, yeah, the whole of that, and I, not my sector, but I can see catalysts for value creation when I when I when I even if I'm mm. not a sector expert. So as you say, Plexus's whole business model has it's been around for 35, 37 years, this business has. It was highly profitable, Plexus was, and it was valued at 300 million um, pounds market cap about eight years ago. So this is not a fly-by-night, aim, mm. jam tomorrow, blue, blue sky type of thing. It's an established business. It's had seven or eight years of very poor, poor performance. But the whole um, crux of the business is that it has wellheads, patented wellhead designs that are leak-free. Whereas um, the, the the world, the oil and gas sector seems to have switched to very cheap uh, Chinese made wellheads about eight years ago, which meant that demand for Plex is completely dried up. So it's proven best in class technology, all patent protected and with a new family of patents about to go in for another 20 years. It's licensed by the world's largest oil services company, as you flagged up last time we spoke, Schlumberger. Who are now, we believe, according to Plexus's results last week, looks as if it, it, it's in the final stage of testing with Schlumberger about to launch globally a suite of products um, with Plexus. It's called PosGrip, the technology. Yeah. And Plexus said it's going to be a bit like your laptop with Intel inside sticker on it. You know, it'll mm -hmm. be Schlumberger making and selling and marketing all the products. Right. And then it'll sort of have, you know, PosGrip yeah. inside type of thing. Now, this is going to initiate a new stream of royalties at between 3% and 6% of all the revenues from the products that 
can never say that. Uh, manages to sell. So the point, I mean, Plexus is only valued about 22 million. I believe the IP alone is worth multiples of that, um, mm. evidenced by the fact they actually sold some of the IP to uh, another big oil company, Technip, yeah. um, in a, about six years ago. And I think they got in 20, 25 million pounds um, just for sort of selling some tangential um, IP yeah. to Technic. So we know this stuff is real and that it works. So the, the methane leakage thing is now the potential catalyst to bring the company alive again. Yeah. And um, the evidence is looking good because they won their biggest ever contract, Plexus did, yeah. um, in March this year, which was, was subsequently increased from 5 million to 8 million. And that's a one year rental deal. So if you take that into account, well, what do rental companies typically get valued at? Six, seven times? Um, it, it all depends on, yeah. EBITDA on, or whatever. And what type of yeah, equipment, well that, but yeah, EBITDA. It does, yeah. it does. But that implies to me that Plexus has got equipment and know-how worth maybe 50, 60 million, mm. um, which is not on the balance sheet. So whether it's fully depreciated or what, I don't know. But I just think if a company, a tiny nano cap, can get an £8 million rental contract that's mm. all recognised in one year, they've got something pretty special there. So it's their business model. It's, it's royalties to Schlumberger and renting out these uh, pos grip um, devices. Is, is that the is that the yeah? Model, they it? they seem to have m several multiple uh, several revenue streams. I mean, the relationship with Schlumberger seems very very close, mm -hmm. and Schlumberger are referring customer inquiries to Plexus. They've got some sort of joint sales and marketing board, yeah. I believe. Um, and Plexus can build and sell. Well, actually, it outsources the manufacture of the PulseGrip products to Schlumberger. So it seems very, they seem very closely entwined. So my theory, and this is only a theory, is that if 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 the, the new range of Schlumberger products uh, with uh, Plexus's IP sell well, the logical thing is they might just yeah. make uh, management an offer they can't refuse. And management own 59% of Plexus, um, right. so they're not going to sell it cheap. Um, so I just think it's a really intriguing situation where your downside risk is pretty well covered. Mm -hmm. I should mention it had a going concern material uncertainty yeah. statement in the results. Wasn't a big surprise. Um, and um, there will be a, um, a fundraise at some point in the next year, because that was pre-announced in October 22, mm -hmm. um, but it for the convertible loans, but it didn't lock into the share price at the time, which was only 2p. The share price is now 21p. So therefore, the dilution shouldn't be that great. Yeah. Um, so I don't think either of those things are, are things to particularly fear. But whenever I mention Plexus to anyone, they immediately go to those negatives and say, oh, it's a basket case. Well, actually, it isn't a basket case. Mm -hmm. And I would say the risk of it, two big things, isn't it? It's risk of insolvency and risk of dilution. Yeah. And I think in both those cases, Plexus, I think, looks all right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just in terms of the, the USP for Plexus, compared against the Jap sorry, the, the Chinese competitors, how better is the POS grip than those, those Chinese competitors in terms of sealing the methane? Because you wouldn't compete on price with these guys, but pres no, presumably I there is some sort of a technical issue that gives you better performance. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really going beyond my area of expertise. So yeah. I mean, I can only really regurgitate what Plexus itself yeah. says. But it says that the, the, there aren't any other. No, I think there's one company in the world, Technip, which licensed Plexus's technology mm. and Plexus itself, who can offer guaranteed for life leak free wellheads. Right, okay. uh, the Chinese stuff is cheap, but it will, you know, maybe uh, it, I think they're talking long term, sort of 2025 years, mm -hmm. it's pretty much guaranteed to develop leaks. And then um, uh, uh, curing the leaks, so Plexus tell me, is nigh on impossible. There's a whole industry around fixing wellhead leaks, but it, there isn't a sort of permanent solution to it um yeah, okay. so what plexus said in its last update was now that you've got this driver from the methane um environmental and government governments have latched onto this methane thing big time because mm. it turns out you know it's hugely more damaging per cubic meter or whatever than co2 yeah. and so it's a quick fix for or, or a quick and relatively straightforward way of of stopping the greenhouse effect or or, or curtailing it mm -hmm. would be to drive industry the oil and gas industry to to um reduce its meet these methane leaks which are on a huge scale apparently it's now being measured from space and they're finding it's 
uh, one article I read said it's over 10 times what the disclosed amount is. Mm. Um, and Plexus is right in the sweet spot. Yeah. So what they're saying at Plexus is, how can any of these big oil majors now install a cheap rubbish wellheads that they know at some point are going to leak mm. when Schlumberger are going to be selling a leak-free for life range? Yeah. So you see, we don't know how it's going to pan out, but this is a very, very big tailwind for Plexus, mm. potentially. Yeah. Um, I, don't know how you, I, I don't know how you value Plexus shares right now. You mm. know, maybe 20p or thereabouts is about right, yeah. given risk reward. But yeah. I think your upside potential on it could be absolutely massive. And I think your downside risk is, well, they probably sell the company to Schlumberger for above the current price, you know? Yeah. I mean, with a market, even at the current price, isn't it? What, of a 24p, it's still only 25 million market cap. So Yeah, yeah. Right. But it's it's so volatile. I mean, this morning it went up 20% and came down 10%. So you, it's just oh, all did. over the place. You just have to live with the volatility, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. what I did was I just bought in on the red days, you know, yeah, just sorry. just wait for it to dip down a bit. And then every now, I think there's a lot of traders yeah. uh, going in and out of the shares. So it's surprisingly yeah. liquid for a nano yeah. cap. Yeah. How do you manage the position size in it, though, Paul, in terms of your own sort of risk tolerance? Because obviously you've gone into it quite big. And uh, I mean, I, my sort of strategy next year is not try is, is to be brave, but not, you know, is not, is not go too far on the risk yes. the spectrum, et cetera. How do you sort of like how you sort of like move in that one? I mean, obviously, you've got a special situation here, which very much does with Plexus seems to be in the right place at the right time. But how mm. how do you manage that sort of total portfolio? Because you could either knock the ball out of the park next year. You know, if let's be clear, if it goes from 24p to three quid, which is the, you know, get back to its all time high, then, mm. <laughs> then you'll just be having Christmas every single day. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you're right to flag flag risk. And it's it is inherently risky. I suppose I suppose I've relied on my judgment just to, to uh, from I've done a lot mm. of work on this. And yeah. and I think there are good reasons to take a risk. Have I gone in bigger than I should to be prudent? Yes. Yes, I'm fully aware of the risk and I have taken an elevated risk on it. Um I suppose, you know, you always have to weigh up the downside, don't you? I think we're all guilty of looking at a sham that we think is good and then saying, right, the upside is this. And just as you just alluded to, you know, the, the knock the ball out the park upside is, is tremendously exciting. But we also have to stop and think about what would I do if it put out a profit warning? What yeah. would I do if it suddenly <laughs> announced, you know, suspended pending clarification of the financial situation, mm. which usually means a zero, doesn't it? Yeah. So I feel with Plexus, yes, it would be a huge setback for me if it went to zero, but it wouldn't actually impact my life in terms yeah, of yeah. having to change things like where I live or, yeah. you know, how much I've got to spend on whatever each yeah. each month you know so i think that's the main thing isn't it and for people who've got kids or dependents of any kind or mortgages and things like that they just need to be much more careful don't they yeah what, um, what sort of percentage you know, is plexus of your holding at the moment of your portfolio i'd rather i'd rather not say paul i tell you why because uh, i ended up getting into a bit of a spat on a bulletin board about that where somebody <laughs> just made a figure up and put it out as if Oh, right. you know and i just yeah. thought oh you know I d so i took him to task for then said you're just making this up and it all yeah. got a bit fractious yeah so I, I think it's just best not to say yeah yeah and i mean I, i've interviewed I mean, it, sorry, i interviewed on. i interviewed this sort of like richard crow cotney rebel about i don't know two months ago and he said his largest position was about 30 percent had a similar sort of logic as you if it goes totally pear-shaped then it will not change his quality of life at all it would be a yes. big black eye and likewise i typically 30 percent is my sort of limit. I know Richard Staveley has had 40 to 45% as a sort of heavyweight in, in his portfolio. Really? A, yep. He's had a concentrated portfolio of about 10 to 15 stocks. I think it was, it was a marketing company some time ago that he, he cut down. So it all, it all comes down to your risk tolerance and whether you've got and your certainty on the actual, you know, sort of like the, the company in particular. Yeah, that's exactly. And, you know, so with Richard Stavely, actually, out of interest, uh, Paul, was yeah. that the his personal portfolio? Or, no, or no, no, no. It was before Rockwood became it was ah. it was the it was the Gresham strategic when he was running that when he set it up originally, um, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, etc. Mm. He he inherited a portfolio and in what in one of them, it was a market. It was an online marketing company. 
that yeah. reached he was helping to turn it round and he he did a, such a great job as he does <laughs> the, the 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 share price rocketed and it ended up to be 40 to 45% and over a period he managed to get rid of you know to basically yes. cut it down and actually exited it i think he got taken out even at a higher price but it was just too, even too heavy for him yeah this is the thing isn't it with small cap and micro cap funds they're at such a massive disadvantage because mm. they can't go in and out yeah. so any mistakes they make they're stuck with them. Yeah. Whereas as private investors, we've got that we've got this huge advantage. But I think with Richard Staveley, because he's so I mean, his his interview he did with, with someone else or, or was it the uh, I think it might have been Investor Meet Company. Mm. It was like a just a masterclass mm. in how to extract value from shares and the activism they do. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to listening to your interview yeah. with him um, because it, it was literally a, a masterclass, isn't it? In, in, <laughs> he's just he's just brilliant at what they do. Yeah, so, he certainly does. He does well. That whole stable in, at Harwood. Oh, I know uh, Christopher top, Mills is stable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah uh, uh, they're brilliant. And also, what was the other point I was going to make about that? Um, oh, yeah. One of my readers suggested when you look at the positions that they hold, look at the date, because yeah. if it's an old one and they haven't added to it, it might be something that they've lost faith in. Yeah. So don't, you know, just because they're in at 7% on a particular share, it's not a guarantee that they're still keen on it. You know? I think, yeah, I think you just need to be taken a bit wider than that, actually, because what happens is that because it's all registered under Harwood, then you've got to look at it over the Odessian portfolio, the Rockwood Strategic and the uh, Oryx and also his um, North Atlantic funds. Those all those sort of yes. like, you know, investment trusts. If you get to 30 percent, then Harwood needs to put a, an offer in on the table. So Richard or what somebody might have only seven percent, but actually it, there's a bigger holding elsewhere. So, for instance. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 That explains it, actually, because when I was hearing Richard and Christopher Mills giving separate interviews, um, it, it, sometimes the percentages didn't tie up. So that, that, that explains why. So, yeah, yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. OK, now it's moving on to defence. Another one you've knocked the ball out this this year. You pointed out MS International, and it just seems to, again, be in the right place at the right time. It has a, it does a whole bunch of engineering, but it's sort of a real successful division. Seems to be this sort of like um, it's it does sort of guns, I think, onto um, US Navy um, vessels that knock uh, drones out the air. And I, I'm guessing I just heard some big orders from the US Navy. Um, probably to do exactly the same. So do you want to give us an update on this one? Yeah, it's a tricky one, MS International, because they don't really put much information out. And mm. quite often, guys who are invested in this seem to pick things up from the trade press, you know, about yeah. orders received and so on. Um, I think, yeah, it looks very, very good. Owner managed uh, a business with four different divisions, all of which are successful in their own niches. Um, and... Um, it's worth reading the annual report in full on MS International because the directors are incredibly long serving. Mm. They've been in there decades, you know, and at some point because of just because of just, you know, nature, people will get to a point where they want to retire. But um, so I think I don't think they've indicated they want to retire. I think they were the people who just love to, doing what they're doing. Mm. So it looks very, very interesting if you join up all the, the dots on MS International. Looks yeah. set to produce bumper interims, I think, because I think there was some business. Is that the one where some orders got deferred, uh, which are going to hit? Maybe, I think maybe current, yeah. Yeah, I think it was where some orders are going to hit the, the current financial year. It, uh, in addition to which they've got big orders from like you say u.s naval guns and anti-drone things so it looks very very interesting i think yeah yeah and they've got a solid balance sheet with a big order book so it says they're doing mm. something right that's for sure i guess the only thing is is again the liquidity on that it'll it's quite tough to buy shares i know i tried to do it about 15 yeah. years ago and gave up <laughs> quite quickly <laughs> Yeah, you're right. And also, I think this question marks over directors pay. I think they've over rewarded themselves. Right. Um, but personally, I don't let that stop me investing in something if mm. the story is good enough. But it's it's definitely a negative. But uh, yeah, it looks very interesting. Yeah, yeah. OK, now let's move on to another one. Spectra, Spectra Systems, which does sort of like mm. covert sort of like um, banknote uh, printing technology and also I think brand auth authentication as we've had so many fraudsters out there in terms of putting, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like counterfeit money and counterfeit product and all this sort of stuff. I'm guessing these guys are doing well to have those sort of like, you know, countermeasures to help uh, the likes of central banks. Sure, take us through this one because my, my only take would be that obviously we're moving to digital money, but, uh, it, you know, it's yeah, obviously got that's... something good. 
Yeah, I mean, that's what everyone says, but um, uh, it doesn't seem to have affected them at all, mm. um, if anything. And it's, it, I think it looks very interesting. It's one of those strange little obscure companies, Spectre is. I think the ticker's SPSY. It's yeah. one of those strange little things that when you first look at it, you think, well, this is all a bit weird. You know, it just has a slightly funny sort of feel to it. But I have to say, that was that was my inkling three or four years ago. But I have to say, it's just uh, executed superbly mm. in the last few years. Very, very strikingly low central costs. So mm. it seems to be a little more than really a handful of people um, who've just, it's a know-how company. You know, they just yeah. seem to, so they, they make very, very high uh, net profit margins. Yeah, 22% EBIT margin. So <laughs> they're doing it, pretty yeah, well. They've got something there. Yeah, and it and it's it's accumulated a nice cash pile, which mm. is just announced today. It's spending some of that on an acquisition, and and yeah. you know the figures they gave in the in the update today yeah. for this acquisition. It's profitable. It's one of their existing suppliers that they've worked with for several years. They say, and they have a very high opinion of the company and the management. So I'm increasingly warming to acquisitions as a theme, where companies buy what they know. Yeah, you yeah, know no, the acquisition. I, yeah, it's quite yeah, interesting. It was quite interesting, actually, because one of the comments on Stockopedia to your to your note was that actually it moves them with this acquisition this morning up into the big league against the likes of sort of like, you know, the the Delarues of this world. And I think there's another one out in the in Europe who is also pretty big into sort of right. money, mon, m money countermeasures, etc. So uh, I don't know what your thoughts yeah. are. Well, I only read the. Um, I don't know this sector mm. work broadly enough to to really comment. But all all I can say is that in the RNS today, you know, they gave the revenue of the audited September twenty two figures and and the profit for the company they're buying, and then gave the management accounts to September ninety uh, two thousand twenty three. So you could you could see straight away from those numbers that this is a proper profitable established <clears throat> business that they're buying. That's an obvious fit with uh, Spectra Systems itself, where they know the management very, yeah. very well. So I think, yeah, I think the shares went up 7 or 8% this morning in reaction. So mm -hmm. it looks to me like the market, you know, you can so easily see value destroyed by acquisitions, can't you? But I think this fits in the category where Spectra sat on a big cash pile for a long time. Yeah. And it's obviously found something that's a good fit and they're not overpaying for it. So yeah, ticking the box for me. I think it looks a good acquisition. Yeah, if they, might, if they buy companies that can drive <laughs> both bottom and top line growth, I mean, clearly yes. with a synergistic deal, then it takes out a lot of cost. Plus, it, if it gives them something extra as well and gives you the economies of scale, then uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's no, hopefully. It's a no I mean, brainer, isn't it? I mean, look, look at Judges Scientific. If you oh, yeah. Yeah, it's stunning, isn't it? I mean, I don't hold Spectra, but I'm not really sure why, because I've liked the company for quite yeah. a long time, yeah. but I never got around to actually buying any, which is a bit frustrating, but yeah, it's the way it yeah. goes sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. Well, one company actually, you, 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 you know, you mentioned was is in basically Forex, Forex sort of like systems and uh, international payments is equals. Now, as you know, I, I own a big position and I... It's it's going through a current strategic review, which involves yes. it's had interested parties. So it's a bit of a special situation at the moment. But just coming back to the original point, I I bottled before the strategic review and top sliced my position because it got to thirty percent. It's still my biggest position at twenty percent. Mm. But uh, I don't know what your sort of like your your views on it in terms of you know sort of like international payments and and this area because it, it's definitely got. Uh, it, it could be in a, a position such as this splurge of m a it's another target in terms of somebody taking up taking it out yeah well i put it on the list mainly actually because i thought i'm curious to see what your latest view is oh okay right. <laughs> okay so well i mean my, my i mean my 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 latest view the key the key nuts and bolts of it comes down to its usps okay why is it growing strong double digits? And it's going to, it's done about sort of like 30, 40% this year, but it'll probably do on a steady state basis next year, 19, 20% like. So the question is, is that sustainable? Is it justified? And it comes down to differentiation. It's got, it's got a, a best in class, you know, bank grade straight through processing platform that effectively knocks the ball out of the park against traditional banks. But the thing it wins on against all the other fintech players, it also adds on the forex expertise. So if you've got a big client, this is this is the this is really the acid test, because it it offers sort of treasury services to small and mid caps, which is where it was bread and butter is. Yeah, 
Yeah. But because that, that that mix of straight through processing and offering tre specialist treasury service like forwards and futures and all this sort of stuff, how to manage your Forex, it's getting big, big corporate clients. Now, if you are a Coke, for instance, then yeah. there's no way, yeah, you're going to go to a small provider and and, and, and and knock out your relationship with somebody like Barclays or, you know, sort of like Citibank or or, or even HSBC. <clears throat> there's just no chance you're going to do that, yeah, unless you're absolutely certain that this new smaller company equals has got something. And if it can offer you huge price, you know, sort of like, you know, benefits, and it can offer you the specialist, the specialist you need, and it reduces your risk because – Rather, because let's be clear about it, Coke, Coke might put 20 million quid, you know, a day easily, say to, I don't know, somewhere in Europe, for instance, to pay some payroll, etc. cetera. Yeah. Last thing it wants is that 20 million quid in transit for 48 hours. You Equals would do it in 15 minutes. And so it takes ooh, all of that ooh. sort of like, you know, reduces the cost, but also improves your working capital. And more importantly, it reduces that non-completion. If one of the banks in between in two days goes belly up, if you had a credit Swiss and it was transitioning your money, mm. you've got a problem unless the government stands by it. So that's it. That's the differentiation. I don't know what your, your, your sort of thoughts on it. Well, I like equals just b before I um, sort of question it. I, I do like it. I've looked at it a few times and you filled me in on a lot of the details. And I thought the webinars of management were very, very good. Mm. I remember listening to those um, would have been back in April because I can rem remember where I was when I was listening to them. Yeah. And um, no, I think it looks very promising. My only caveats are on mm. this, and I appreciate, you know, way more. No, than please. I yeah is that there seem to be an awful lot of these companies and they all say pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Um, but the banks have, have basically handed a segment of the market over to these smaller um, groups that are competing for, for the market share. So I'd just be worried that at some point the banks might sort of wake up and say, well, hang on, look, we're giving away too much. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's get some of it back. Um, and um, the one I do like, I know it's slightly different. I looked at Record, REC. Oh, yes. Yeah, they're, now they're really they're an asset manager. They're a forex asset manager and yeah. sort of like specialist sort of like consultancy in foreign exchange, aren't they? That's right. Yeah, so it's not yeah. directly comparable to equals, but it looks really interesting. I have yeah. to say, I thought the the management webinar they did with the outgoing CEO, um, you know, chaired it, and and it uh, on valuation um, and on forward outlook. I thought that looked very good. And as you say, yeah. it's a, a different setup and they've got some new funds that they're setting up, which mm. are at the final launch stage. Yeah. Um, one is something to do with crypto and one is something to do with something else. So anyway, people, I don't hold a position in it, but I just thought it looked interesting. No, you're so that's right. I mean, just as a valuation overlay on that, there's yeah, a, there's a rule of thumb for fund managers. OK, mm. typically they value them at about one percent of AUM. OK, OK. If you did that and it must be slightly not as quite as rich as doing normal sort of equity managing, you know, doing Forex. But but if you did that, they've got eighty five billion dollars of assets under management in the Forex. Yeah, You take a one percent of that, you get eight hundred and fifty million dollars. Gosh, you yes. then divide that by one point three and you get probably about. 600 million market cap the mm. current market cap is about well, 140 <laughs> so yeah think... yeah and no it's an interesting interesting um angle on it paul i think some of their assets under management is notional yeah okay. um where it's sort of based on derivatives or swaps or something like that yeah. um rather than actual hard currency yeah. but uh i mean i haven't done that much work on record but i just well, yeah. Love throwing me ideas out, you know, yeah, to the, yeah, yeah. To the another viewers. One, another one you've warmed to, you, you, you just recently, is 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 cake box, isn't it? Because um, they do some oh, like yeah. cr fresh oh, cream cakes, special I, speciality ones. Actually, Paul, I just had two quick remarks on the on the currency ones as well. Oh yeah. So um, Argentex is another one, but that put out bad news and dropped. We mm. looked at that when it was about sixty p, and we thought it was actually quite good value. Mm. So that was one idea. And then finally. What I have only looked at for the first time this morning, Cornerstone. Oh, yes. CSFS is the ticker. Now, this is only 9 million market cap, but it caught my eye this morning. I don't normally go below 10. Mm. 
but it caught my eye because it put in a, a head of expectations update. So I spent some of the morning on it. It looks really interesting. Mm. Shore Capital's just upgraded from 0.1 million PBT to 0.7 million PBT in the current year, which means it probably won't have to do a placing. Um, it's delivering fantastic growth. Is that one you've looked at as you're the sector I, I, expert? To be, to be brutal, I've, I've, I'm in payment so heavily, but I haven't really is. done the slide roll over it, so I can't really comment. All I've, I've put it into the box as such that mm. it's the, 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 the bigger companies will get bigger rather than the, and they'll knock the smaller ones out. But I could be wrong on Cornerstone because it, it, it consistently you know, delivers very very strong top line growth which says it's got something there it would not yes. be winning customers and increasing its transaction volumes unless it had something quite unique i actually mm. think there's a couple of guys who set it up from equals actually oh that's interesting yeah Somebody... i looked at the sh i looked at the shareholder list for for cornerstone and it's nearly all individuals i think they've only got one institution mm. But about the other 75%, which I, I didn't cross-check the names, but I would imagine some of those are directors and founders and so on. Yeah. Uh, just an idea. Just, I just no, thought I'd throw it out there. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, no, it's definitely worth having a, uh, having a look at. The whole payment space has been repriced over the last two years because it got that huge boost during the pandemic when everybody had to basically go digital. And, and most of the business, certainly on the consumer side, took off. They didn't so much on the business because it impacted a lot of business sort of like, you know, activity levels. Um, yeah. and, and but certainly now, you know, the likes of, well, as I say, it's cornerstone and equals, they've been knocking at sort of like, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent organic and now repeat mm -hmm. like for like organic growth, which just says it's it's taken off. So there's a, but something's happening, isn't it? Something yeah. good. Yeah, anyway, I we'll agree. Wait, we'll, we'll, We'll wait and see. So coming on to um, on the consumer, on the yeah, well, on the consumer. Let's go broad actually first before we jump into into Catebox. What is your sort of view on the consumer? Because obviously the online retail, as you pointed out, with the likes of the Chinese operators, the um, you know the the, the Shein's and the Timus have absolutely annihilated Asos and Boohoo. Mm. Um, but in terms of the health of the consumer, how are you seeing that and positioning your sort of like your, your thoughts? Well, I think we're over the worst now with the cost mm. of living thing, because average wages, uh, according to the ONS, are now rising faster than the latest inflation prints. Mm. And I think households generally have probably already made whatever adjustments we all decide to do to our spending. Um, and it's the usual thing, Paul, isn't it? During any time of sort of economic squeeze, the good companies keep trading well. Yeah. And it's the also rounds who really struggle. So... I've, I'm not looking at any of the really small kind of also ran type retail mm. um, businesses because I think, you know, something like the works, for example, I think is just really struggling now. And I can't see the point in going down to that small level where there's not really a USP. It's kind of just about breaking even or above. Although that, that could be where you get your leverage, isn't it? If, yeah. if, if consumer spending, so I'm, I'm pretty bullish about consumer spending from April 2024 for the reasons mentioned before. And I think given that you've got um, a big private equity interest that came in and, and a buying restaurant group, which was a real surprise, wasn't it? Who would have thought yeah, private equity but buying hospitality it looked, sector? It looked like a basket case rest, uh, restaurant group to me. The balance sheet was terrible. Oh, the balance sheet was terrible. Yeah, so, uh, but it doesn't seem to have put off, um, yeah. is it Pumero, one of the really yeah. big, or one of those really big out, private equity outfits. So I think that's um, focused attention back on consumer stocks. Um, SCS, and if you remember, you, you like, mentioned SCS got taken out as well. The oh, guys. yes, it did. Yeah, that was by a trade buyer. Okay. Um, but that was, I mean, that was crazy. They basically bought it using scs's own cash pile mm. you know i know people say oh it's the, it's the customer's cash because it's paid up front but if that permanently rotates you can you can actually take that cash out of the business mm. which is precisely what happened so um i think you're yeah, right so i think you're certainly right it's the big scene the big the big ones or the, or, the, or should we say the more sort of like some will there'll be a lot of distinction between the good the winners and the losers because next mm. and mns both seem to have done pretty well over the last year, despite the sort of cost of living. And I'm with you. I think the, the consumer is normalising their behaviour. It's got over that mm. initial shock of energy from 18 months ago. Yeah, absolutely right. Funnily enough, you read my mind. I was just about to mention m, m and and oh, Next. Okay. Um, I mean, I think they're up with events now, arguably. Um, so I missed the trade on m and which was annoying, actually, because I remember doing a 
the three minute fast pitch for it at an investor meeting a few <laughs> years ago. And I said, this thing's really turning around. Nobody believed me. But I was Richard Crow to... did, because that's one of his bigger positions. I know. He's brilliant, isn't he? He's just he so is. good. And he gets the timing right as well, which I, I've, I'm, I'm not. I'm usually a couple of years too early. But yeah, I think I think it's worth taking a fresh look at the hospitality sector. Um, what about cake box then on, on that hospitality? Oh, so cake box, yeah. Now, I've always been a little bit picky on that yeah i know they've had some just basically because they've scored some fairly major own goals in the past mm. um uh so it had it right rightly had a bad smell about it because mm. the previous fd well if you look back at the history of it um i, I can't say what i think about it yeah okay. <laughs> but yeah, you know okay. and that smell does linger there's no doubt about it but they they seem to have cleaned things up there now don't mm. they with a with a fresh fd who's been in a while now so i think anything more bad would have come out by now but i, lo I looked at kate box recently on the latest update i can't remember if it was a trading update or results but i mean i couldn't help but give it the thumbs up because yeah. it's it ticks <laughs> everything you know nice strong balance sheet with some freeholds on it plenty of cash is paying very generous divvies it's on a you know a fairly Easy. modest PE ratio considering it's a yeah. self-funding self-funding rollout. They don't have much operational risk because it's operated through franchisees. No, I mean, it ticks all the boxes, doesn't it? I mean, what's yeah. your what's your no, no, no. The only gripe that you had when you talked to me was that they didn't sell um, low sugar cakes oh, yes, and di yes. for diabetics. You were saying, yes. I'm gonna, uh, you asked me to speak to Soup, the CEO, to basically nudge him in the right direction. So you That's can right. Get yourself a fresh cream, low, low sugar cake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you're right. No, but... no, I mean, it looks it looks dead rock solid, and it fits in with the MA because it had a sort of like an opportunistic bid from. Oh yeah, Australian that was a bit peculiar. Cheese, cheese, yeah, cheese that was a bit company. odd. The cheesecake company. Yeah, was that about one pound sixty or something? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it looked like one of those announcements where they're trying to flush out uh, other buyers, a bit like Equals, mm. you know, and um, where where they just say, "Look, we're up for sale," and I couldn't see any reason why management would. Who, who I think retain controlling shareholdings in Kate yeah. Box. I can't see any reason why, when you're on this super growth trajectory, mm. why you'd want to sell. It doesn't make yeah. sense to me. So, um, I think he, I mean, I, I actually yeah. think the CEO, you know, Suit Jamdal just loves the business. And yes. uh, unless it's a total knockout price, he just gets so much. He's so passionate about it that, uh, yes. you know, he, he, it's his baby, isn't it? You know, he, well, he did. Yeah, and I love founder management. You know, mm. lots of us do because, you know, they tend to run much more conservative balance sheets so that a business doesn't get into trouble in recessions. Mm. They're not empire building and flinging new shares around like owner managers are. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very nice, I think. Yeah, so I like, I like yeah. Kbox. What about just on that consumer and sort of experimental experience type of leisure activities, XP factory? What, what's your, how, are you still holding that or have you totally come out of it? No, I'm still holding it, but it's no longer. I think at one point it was my biggest position. Mm. It's not now because obviously I, you know, when do you sell? Yeah. Well, I think it's when you find something with better risk reward or where you mm. perceive that risk reward yeah. is better. So that's why I um, sold most of them cards on the table um, to just to raise cash to buy Plexus. But I'm still in XP factory. I think yeah. it's a very good concept. The problem you've got with these um, hospitality guys, and it's the same problem uh, that Revolution Bars have got, which I did buy back into a week ago, actually, purely as a speculative trade um, for a takeover bid, because I think yeah, it's okay. a sitting duck for a takeover bid. And, um, the big problem these guys have got is that the staff costs are about 35% of revenues. Mm. So when the 9.8% rise in living yeah. wage comes in, and of course, you then have to up everyone because it concertinas up, doesn't it? As yeah. the higher paid staff want to maintain their differentials. So you're going to have, I modelled a 10% rise in staff costs for Revolution Bars and then worked it back through the P&L and they would have to get like for like sales of 4.8% up next year, purely to cover a 10% uplift on wages. And I would imagine the numbers would be would be similar for, for XP Factory, although they do have a, a mix of um, owned and franchise eed yeah. stores. Yeah. Um, so no, I think I think what they're doing is great, but also it's not unique. You've got a lot of other independents doing experiential leisure as well. Mm. Um, it's definitely taking a, 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 a slice of the cake away from competitors. Yeah. So. Um, 
So yeah, I've just I, the trouble with the XP Factory doesn't matter what they say or how much exposure the shares of, 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 of get, they just don't go up. Mm. So yeah, it's like yeah. you said, you reach a point where you've got an opportunity cost, haven't you? If you've got money tied up in something that's just going nowhere, yeah. even though it could be a perfectly good company, yeah. you've got to weigh up the risk of being, you know, not there if somebody bids for it, yeah. or if suddenly it explodes upward and you miss the boat you've got to weigh that up with uh, yeah. freeing up cash to buy something else where you might see uh, a big sector tailwind as yeah. i saw with plexus so yeah well you certainly can't be you certainly can't be criticized for, for for choosing a faster horse that's for sure because yeah that's plexus, it. You've yeah, doubled your money, you? yeah 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 exactly so so no i still like the fundamentals at xp factory yeah. um but also um there was some muddied water over what the forecasts were it looked like they basically kind of slipped mm. through a downgrade yeah. um, because of the, the change in the year end or something, but the figures didn't reconcile. And mm. so I think it was a kind of under the radar reduction in forecasts, which yeah. didn't go down too well with mm. some investors, I think. Yeah. Now I need to pick your brains on one share that yeah. I know you've talked about quite a lot. Well, not talk, you've written about it quite a lot. Yeah. Now, Supreme. Okay. Now this one. Okay. Which, obviously, oh, Supreme. The Supreme yeah, I just want, I just, I'm picking you, I just want to pick your brains in terms of because I, you know, in terms of obviously nicotine is in vaping, etc. We we know that, etc. I, I just what what is what is the problem with nicotine in compared to sort of alcohol or or or, or other food types or anything else that caffeine, for instance, tea. Mm. I, I don't know in, in terms of because it doesn't seem to do you any harm at all other than it is obviously nicotine is addictive mm, mm. well i mean we're never going to agree on this <laughs> no no, no, I was just, uh, because no, no 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 uh, we don't need to agree i was just wanted to understand for my educational purposes what is the in terms of nicotine it, it, what is the moral issue on nicotine well i mean it's well it's nicotine addiction and as a former nicotine addict myself this is something i'm just uh, like all reformed smokers you know it's something that uh, I, I just don't want to, to invest in it. I appreciate that vaping seems to be far less damaging to health than smoking. Um, I think you're right on that. Although we haven't got enough data over the very long term, have we? But um, it, we, we it, have you know, actually, we have because, because well, because not they, 30, 40 years or whatever. But no, we have because they, because they didn't discover that, that, that smoking cigarette, cigarettes was harmful to health until what the 1960s or something, did they? No, well, that, that's exactly it, you see, because there's two elements to, 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 to tobacco, okay? There's the carcinogenic of the tobacco when you burn mm. it and you get cancer, and then mm. there's the nicotine. And all the health reports, it, it isn't the nicotine that causes you health. It's, it's basically the tobacco which causes you health problems, which is why mm. the NHS say, you know, basically try and get people <clears throat> off tobacco is to go to, is to, go to, um, to vaping. And mm, mm. so there is... At the moment, there's no, there's absolutely no medical science in terms of nicotine. It is addictive, absolutely, but it's not more any addictive than alcohol or, um, you know, basically, you know, types of food or caffeine or, or all this other mm. stuff. It's exactly the same. And yes, you want controls and you've got to ban, you know, you can't allow people like kids to get on it because they can get addicted and all this sort of stuff. But the actually, trouble is they do. This is the problem. Yeah, no, it's exactly. now an, it's va vaping is now described as an epidemic amongst young Agreed. people. And it just makes me sad seeing all these kids yeah. get hooked on nicotine because I know what it's like um, trying to get off nicotine. And it's it's horrific. I mean, they say it's as addictive as heroin. Um, <laughs> well, no, no, seriously, it is apparently. <laughs> Um, so look, we're never going to agree on this. Yeah, I just okay, that's a, that was good. I, no, no, no. I, but I you make good points. You make good points, Paul. And I wouldn't disagree necessarily with what you're saying. I think for me, it's more an instinctive thing. As a as a yeah, as okay, a that's as an fair, dude. Yeah, ex smoker, yeah. I think anything making nicotine addiction products for me is just is just I don't want to get involved. But yeah, the numbers okay. look amazing. The no, numbers for yeah. Supreme. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Oh goodness, I mean, they really are fabulous figures. Yeah. No doubt about it. Well, Outperformed what... trading updates this year. Mm -hmm. A very good dividend yield, I think. Uh, good entrepreneurial management. I like everything about it, apart from that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what will be what will be really interesting, isn't it? Is that they've done this consultation. The government have on vaping, the whole vaping industry, to stamp out, you know, <clears> basically <throat> underage vaping, and also to the other thing they need to sort out, and they are is is the env environmental issue of the disposable vape. Oh yes, yes. I mean that needs to be sorted out. No doubt no, no, about it. Uh, 
So yeah. it'll be very interesting once they've done this consultation, which ends, in fact, I think it's on Thursday, so it's the 6th. <laughs> and then they've got about two months before they decide. So it'll be really quite uh, enlightening to see actually what they, that they decide, because you'd have thought they'll have all the health experts, all the industry experts, and they'll basically, you know, heading into a general election, they won't be, you know, sort of like lazy about it. They'll make sure they get something which is, you know, sort of like voters are going to support. So it's, it's probably likely to be harder rather than lighter. But I, mm. but, but I suspect it isn't going to be any harder than tobacco or, or, you know, alcohol as it currently is, or even, you know, types of, you know, high energy drinks and this sort of stuff i mean yes no i think you're right i mean i don't think there's going to be any sort of Dam damocles moment um mm. with supreme i think it's probably all the all all the issues on regulation and politicians that sound to me like they're all navigable by the company yeah. and it, it's probably going to carry on doing very well so yeah. yeah i mean look and it's not for me to moralize on 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 shares anyway it's more an instinctive just emotional yeah, yeah, response yeah, no. from me you know i know like, I, I think paul paul i'm not criticizing because yeah. i think it's absolutely brilliant that you you know you basically decide what you want to invest and we decide what you don't want to so for instance i will yeah. never i will never invest in tobacco companies because me it, neither it, it, yeah it, not that my yeah. mum was ever smoking but she died of cancer and you know lung oh, cancer yeah. and so you know it, it just isn't going to happen i'm not going to invest in those guys but uh no, you know so you. so, so you've got that, to take Paul. and that's and that's the sort of the you know the call that each investor can take and should take is it's such yeah. that certain things they don't would i invest in chinese stocks i wouldn't know not no, only because I, I don't trust the balance sheets but because i probably don't <laughs> trust beijing either well i was going to say you don't need the balance sheets on that on that <laughs> sentence it's just i don't trust anything yeah i know yeah <laughs> okay now we've got just let's go up market we've got a tech stock um software yes. gresham technologies and i think it, what it does is basically sort of big data cloud systems or, and for, for sort of financial institutions and mainly for banks to help them effectively de-silo all of their independent disparate systems bring it into you know one into one approach and then have one set of numbers to be able to help the whole company both on the client side and on the operational side to be able to maximize essentially all the data they have from all these other systems and it's been doing brilliantly it's, it's flying but it did actually have a slight sort of wobble just recently do you want to give us your, your latest view on this one yeah, well, you've you've described it better than I could, Paul, here. This is because obviously in the small cap value reports, Graham and I look at about 600 companies. So we, we you know, we're, we're, we're only doing fairly superficial reviews mm. of the numbers more than anything, rather than expressing a view on the on what the future outlook is. But Gresham just caught my eye. Again, yeah. I don't have I don't have positions in any of these, really. But Gresham caught my eye because I thought, wow, actually, over the last three or four years, the track record of growth from it has been really impressive and it's um it's been around for donkey's years as a listed company yeah. got very very highly valued i remember years and years pre pre 2008 i think it was listed and it was very very highly valued tech stock all fell rather flat mm. um but it's actually now seems to be delivering very good um figures i think the ticker's ght is it yeah. with gresham it's I, all i'm doing is just flagging it as an idea to have a look because i yeah. think um I just had a quick look at it and thought, oh, this is quite interesting, actually. And the PR lady will be very pleased about that, but she's been badgering me for ages to speak to management. I said, I just haven't got the time. Yeah. But I, I do want to give it a, a mention as something that might be worth people having a look at. Yeah, no, no I hadn't really looked at it for such a long time because of valuation grounds. But because we mm. obviously we were, we were chatting about it, I had a, I had a quick say. I was just doing the financial numbers and it, it trades on about 2.3 times sales, EV sales. Okay which actually for a, a growth software company is, is getting to pretty good value, actually, territory. Yeah, yeah. And these things are often taken out at premium valuations, yeah. aren't they? This yeah. type of business, even the ones that you look at and you think they're absolute rubbish, yeah. they suddenly get bid for. So yeah. I think Gresham works as a standalone share yeah. um, on a very reasonable valuation, I think. Yeah. I think it's a lot of it is recurring revenues as well with established comp companies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And once you once you're in, you you basically it's very difficult to uh, to take you out. I mean, the barriers to exit are, are pretty tough. 
Yeah, yeah. So I think it's worth people having a look at that one. Yeah. Uh, but well, I don't know what, much about. Well, one sort of bugbear I know you, you have on all software stocks is uh, capitalization of developments. Do you want to highlight the sort of like? Oh yes. Go on. I can't remember, Paul. So I'm, I'm horribly uh, ill prepared for today's one because uh, I've I've had the carpet cleaners in this morning and I've been dog sitting two highly temperamental dogs that have been leaping all over me while I've been trying to write the small cap value report. Woof woof. So, <laughs> yes. So I know how Graham, Graham's got a toddler and he tries to write the small cap value report as well yeah. as managing this disruptive toddler. So I know exactly how he feels now. Yeah, yeah. Two canine friends. So sorry, Paul, I can't remember exactly what the capitalised. No, no, no. I was just, it was just more broadly with software companies. That's something that investors all should always have a look at. Just, just, oh, definitely. Yeah. This, yeah, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yeah. So generally for the sector, EBITDA multiples for software companies, mm. I would always check the cash flow statement because a lot of them are burying a ton of their yeah. payroll costs uh, by capitalizing it into intangibles. And, you know, that's fine if it's a discrete project to develop one specific thing but if it's just you know if it's i think one software company was capitalizing about a third of its payroll of its yeah. entire payroll or maybe 25 yeah. percent. well that's that's ongoing isn't it that's day-to-day -day spending i can see the logic for capitalizing it that's fine it's you know expected lifetime of this r d could be 10 15 years or whatever but you can't just ignore it altogether which is what ebitda does yeah. so yeah that's an important point to always bear in mind isn't it yeah Okay, now let's move in sector to uh, the building products. Obviously, that it's been oh, yes. it's been annihilated over the last eighteen months, and housing. But housing's now starting to rebound, which is rather it good is. with the house builders. But the building yeah. products boys haven't, and you sort of highlighted one, which is Etwin, which does sort of doors and windows and sort of external buildings, sort of drains and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. So it does sort of mm. like you know, fairly, you know, sort of like, you know, it's, it's basically economically sensitive to the building and construction industry. It yes. It's on roughly seven times or seven and a half times PE. Um, do you want to give us your latest view on that, on the building sector and also Equin? Sure. I mean, I've called called the low several times incorrectly on, on building products. I thought, well, you know, so um, take everything I say on this with a pinch of salt because <laughs> timing the market isn't my thing. But um, I think some of them are getting very attractively valued. I think last time we discussed the brick uh, makers, didn't we? Yes, and, we did. Um, yeah, and some of them seem to be doing quite surprisingly well because I think they're, in, they're, they're, they're uh, possibly substituting imports. So... Um, mm you know so they're keeping their revenues all right so i still i'm still hovering sniffing around the brick uh yeah. sector um but airpoint in particular caught my eye because we've had quite a few profit warnings from mm. building products companies haven't we marshall's i think is a, a large one that that, that yeah. uh, said the whole everything's soft so what airpoint just struck me in that the most recent update was surprisingly strong it doesn't seem mm. to be suffering any particular downturn and it mentioned in the commentary um, that they've had some new products that they brought in, that they've done uh, efficiency, you know, they've rationalised their, their their premises and so on. I think they've managed to sort of amalgamate production into one site where it might have been in one or two previously. Stuff like that, which means that, as you correctly say, it's only on a PE of about seven times. Mm. I think it confirmed full year expectations recently as well. Um, yeah, and you've got a twice, if this is the right one, I'm pretty sure it is, you've got a twice covered um seven percent yield is that mm. is that what your sheet says as well paul yeah um well the, yeah, I might one, have got... one, one thing that was sort of a broader point really it comes because they've got sort of like it's difficult to understand what their net debt position is because their reported net debt is about 102 million pounds okay but their covenant debt which is the banking debt x these leases you know the the, the IFRS yeah. 16 leases is about 16 million now What's difficult, and this is a this is a broader point that I wanted to sort of pick your brains on. When you have these yeah. wide differences between reported and covenant debt, how do it's you the leases? Yeah, I know. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of how do you rationalise that in terms of your balance sheet strength? Because, I mean, I would personally, I would look at the cash flow <laughs> generated over the interest payments you know and you know the lease the lease payments is that basically it's 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 the interest cover but using cash flow instead i mean how do you how do you view it because it's easy you, you get in these rns's you get you get sort of appointed to 
you know, effectively just bank net bank debt, which is great. But if there's big lot a lot, you know, lease liens liabilities, then if you're not careful, you're going to miss all the rental income which goes through in your interest cost now. In before yeah, you that's the- right. Well, I mean, I've ranted about this dozens of times on mm. Stockopedia. It just IF, IFRS 16 has done serious harm to yeah. the accounts and in, in terms mm. of making them understandable. I mean, I get what they were doing. They were trying to um, put what they see as off balance sheet liabilities onto the balance sheet so yeah. that you can compare um, a company with leased premises with a company that's got freehold premises. But the point is, you don't need to compare them <laughs> because, yeah. I mean, it, it's totally pointless. I think they were trying to they yeah. almost invented a problem to then solve, but it's completely messed up the cash flow statement, as you right say mm. for a multi-site operator like a retailer hospitality and and some you know building products depots you've got a whole ton of operating costs that have now been shunted right down into finance costs yeah. so that makes the operating cash flow figures nonsense figures yeah um so i think it with any accounting standard if people who are using the accounts then have to manually manually adjust out mm. those uh, yes. adjust, those that accounting standard then it's a bad accounting standard mm. um and as you say, the net debt figures are completely messed up. Um, and I, I did check that in my last report on Epwin, mm. in the small cap value reports, and I came to the same conclusion that actually the net debt looks alarmingly high. Yeah. But when you strip out the leases, it's it's very modest and yeah. easily covered by EBITDA. So, yeah, so the debt, but you have to just check each individual company. Mm. Yeah. And I, I wish mean, I they think- would say in that. In the highlights i wish they'd just say net bank debt or covenant debt like as you as i think you, you mentioned before whereas quite often companies score an own goal they'll just say net debt and it'll be some huge figure and people run run for the hills yeah which is I, strange, I, 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 I would prefer them to say actually is the interest cover is the cash flow to interest because with interest rates going up the net debt to EBITDA multiple now is a bit irrelevant at times so just for instance with equity and i'll Good highlight this, I think with investors they, in the in the last in the last interims, it says that it's 0. 0.6 times net debt is is point covenant net debt is 0. 0.6 times EBITDA, which frankly sounds fine to everybody. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But when you work out actually, you know, basically the interest cover on cash on underlying cash flow after you've paid the rental on those leases, you know, it comes out mm. of interest. You only get 1.9 times, and now 1.9 is not a problem, you know, interest cover for cash flow, but actually. I always like at least two to three times, you know, cash flow yes, to interest cover. Very good point. You know, because it just makes me feel a bit un- un- uncertain. If if you if you if suddenly you have a problem, your trading goes down. You've breached. You well, you potentially could breach that cash flow that cash flow covenant. Mm. I think that's such a good point, Paul. Because for for as you say, for about the last fifteen years, the only covenant that really yeah. mattered was yeah. EV to EBITDA, wasn't it? But you're quite yeah. right. Now interest rates have kind of normalised. If that mm. if that, if this is normal, it may not yeah. be. Um, then yeah, the interest cover uh, covenant is really really important. And you've also got quite several banks. Um, I know this happened at Revolution Bars, which I hold. The bank dropped all the profitability related covenants and just imposed a minimum liquidity. Oh wow! Uh, covenant, which is effectively saying, um, is effectively reducing the bank facility by twenty percent, isn't it? Yeah. If yeah. you say don't let it go above that yeah. level, it's yeah. pretty much the same thing. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think bank covenants are so much more important, and a lot of people have got out of the habit. Well, anyone who started investing in the last fifteen years probably won't even have given a second thought to bank covenants, but. Um, now that the banks are, are uh, you know, need to pull the plug on some businesses, if they're continuing to, if they can't even cover their interest payments, the bank's more likely to pull the plug, isn't it? Yeah. And that, I mean, so, the yeah, point, very good yeah, point. Yeah. And the, and, and the thing, the thing to, for investors to watch is that interest includes the rental on those FRFS 16 leases. Yes. So, so what that, I do is I actually manually adjust the cash flow statement yes. and I, and I, and I take out the lease finance costs and take move it back up to the top and cross out operating cash flow and replace it with what the real yeah. number is because leases it's just an operating cost yes. it's 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 i mean when i was an fd in the retail uh, of a retail chain we didn't see the leases as liabilities unless the site was loss making mm. and uh, if the site was profitable the lease was really a gigantic asset yeah 
you know, net, taking the asset, mm. less the liabilities. And we wouldn't get rid of it unless somebody offered us a huge premium for the lease. Whereas yeah. we had other sites that were losing money where we would have to pay a substantial reverse premium for somebody to take it off our hands. Mm. So I feel the original accounting standard of requiring an onerous lease provision was perfect. It yeah. never should have been um, altered in my <clears> view, but... The yeah, audit, the audit, uh, the audit industry was just basically wanted to make a change so they could make some money off it back of it, didn't they? <laughs> totally good, a like good was, wasn't helping investors whatsoever. Now another <laughs> one in that sector, construction um, firm group Kia, huge, huge order book of about ten billion, which is about two and mm. a half years revenue cover, but it's it's sort of net debt and cash position just fluctuates enormously. It sort of yes. shoots up every re end of reporting period, but. <clears throat> They reported sort of like average net debt at about two hundred and thirty million uh, pounds, compared to an EBITDA of about two hundred million. So it's not, it's not, it's it, it's got more leverage than the other ones like Galliford Try or uh, mm. Babcop, for instance. But um, it's 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 probably what's your sort of latest on this one? It's still very very cheap, obviously. Yeah, well, that's why I added it to the list. I'm not claiming to know necessarily that much about the group, but. It came up on my list of things where I went through the accounts and I thought, oh, mm. blimey, this thing's cheap, even when you do uh, adjust for the debt. And yeah. obviously um, something that was in the budget was quite interesting, sorry, the autumn statement, mm. was that the government are actually good payers. They pay pretty promptly. And the argument now is that they need to get the contracting companies to actually pay their subcontractors a bit better. <laughs> So, uh, so, so, and also another po great point you mentioned that was one of my um, repetitive bugbears is is net cash figures at year ends and interim. That yeah. is just a one day snapshot, mm. so easy to manipulate and window dress it. So, average net cash, ideally average daily net net cash yeah. and all net debt is the is the number we need to see what the underlying, what the genuine uh, mm. cash or debt position is. And Headlam deserve a uh, praise for this HEAD, the carpet distributor. They actually put a graph in their slide pack, which shows oh, you God. the average daily net, net debt over the whole year. Well, I mean, that couldn't be better, could it? No. So yeah, we really need to nag the accounting standards people and anyone of you will listen really, mm. to get companies to give us average daily net debt. That's the only meaning. And, and then you want the year high and the year low don't you yeah. as well as the average daily then we can then we can really work otherwise your enterprise values just a fantasy number isn't it mm. well it is if you've got a big seasonality or you've got these these mm. types of upward and down from, from i mean most normal businesses it isn't too bad they'll generate x amount each yes. month you know it'll just keep yes and i think more. smith's news report very well on this as well because yeah. they have huge uh kind of flows of money in on one day and huge mm. flows of money out on another day, batch paying suppliers and you know getting big lumps of money in. So they make good disclosures on cash. But going back to Keir, yeah, I think you've got a PE of just over five. Yeah. You've got a balance sheet that I think is all right, actually, overall. One thing, uh, when one you thing on a... the balance sheet, which is, again, a general point for investors, is mm. that it's reporting a surplus on the accounting pensions. Oh, OK. Paid, but it's got a deficit on its actuarial. So... Yeah. In terms of how do you, you know, how would you adjust that? In just particularly on the cash flow, because it's got to basically fund that deficit on the actuarial until it becomes yes. zero. Yeah. Well, this is another area where area where accounting standards are horribly <laughs> awry. Um, so, I mean, all I'm interested in is the cash effect yes. the balance sheet has. Probably like yourself, I just cross out the numbers on the balance sheet, assets mm. or liabilities. And I look at what the actual cap, they usually have an agreed payment plan where there's an actual yes. deficit three or more years ahead. Yeah. And I just total up the, 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 and put that on the balance sheet as a liability, Yeah. Um, which, you know, at the moment, a lot of things are up in the air, aren't they? Most companies seem to be reporting better uh, pension deficits, but that disguises a huge drop in asset values as mm. uh, bonds of gone down a lot yeah. but the way they measure the liabilities has also dropped a lot yeah. so it's a bit opaque isn't it pension scheme accounting mm. um it only hits, but, hits you where you've got to pay the cash and i'm with you you've got to yeah. adjust out for your enterprise value the cash payments that they need to do to right size that to get the actuarial back into yeah. surplus and also you know pension scheme trustees 
I would say generally in the last couple of years where we've had these multiple crises of the pandemic and the, the energy crisis and so on and supply chain problems, generally trustees have been accommodative, haven't they? Because they don't want to kill off the golden goose. They want to. So they've usually ha it, we, we know that pension schemes now do have a history of helping out in terms of deferring payments or ag agreeing reduced payments. So I don't tend to I don't let pension deficits scare me off completely. No, um, but you do have to you know, accept that there is volatility and element of risk involved as well. But I'd rather have to, a, a big pension deficit than a big bank loan. Yes, no, I'd agree. Yeah, yeah, you can manage the pension deficit, hopefully. And one thing which is yeah. also is, is quite good is that you can get a very late Christmas present from it. If you've got a if you've got a business that hasn't got an actuarial deficit and has got a big surplus and you get it off your balance sheet, you could well get a big payment back on that surplus i.e because the you know you don't need you don't it doesn't the, the person who's taking it doesn't need all that particular surplus it's all very rare though very oh, rare it happened, though. It happened uh, recently actually it happened recently but um i can't yeah. remember which i know smith's news got nine to ten million back but i mean oh. i've i've not it's not the thing that's an everyday occurrence it's very no, no, rare no, 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 but no, it can right. it can happen the trouble is i've heard from companies who've looked at this route of doing mm. buyouts of the pension scheme they say the trouble is the provider of whoever's doing the buyout deal wants to put their x percentage margin on top of yeah, it yeah yeah you know so for that reason i mean if, i think if you get any cash back from pension deficit it, see it as a sort of bonus rather than something to bank on yeah i'm just now moving to it sort of industrials reynold which is the chain maker for sort of conveyor belts and for airports but also for mining i think a whole bunch of different industries top yes. notch sort of product etc do you want to give us your latest on this one because it's uh it's i mean you know it's crazy value it's sort of like less than six times pe it is, but that's partly because of the pension deficit, which yeah. I think takes five or six million a year in in cash yes. out of the business. Yes. But they've they've done tremendously well over the last few years. Funnily enough, Kevin Taylor um, gave a little talk about this at Mellow last week, and he 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 very much echoed my opinion on it. I'm a long term holder here, but again, he's, a, he's, he's an investor, Kevin Taylor. Yes, yes, yeah. he's he's a um, professional investor, former banker, I think. So yeah. you know, he knows his knows his onions. And he was saying um, with Reynolds, you know, that he thinks it's it's way too cheap. I think he's right. Mm -hmm. And he put some figures up that showed even if you take if you gross up the the cash payments on the pension deficit to add it on as if it were about, say a bank loan, the shares are still really cheapy. And I think he's absolutely yeah. right. You've also got the beauty with Reynold now that it's <clears throat> it's on the front foot. So I think a lot of investors still think it's financially just distressed mm. because it was for a long time. But yeah. it's way past that now. It's tur They've turned the business around very, very well. It's now making lovely uh, cash generation. Um, it's self-funding some good acquisitions. Again, the acquisi acquisitions we, we both like where they buy businesses they know that they've known for years doing similar things but maybe that can fill in some geographic regions you know where yeah. they haven't got a presence all the all the acquisitions have made a lot of sense with Reynolds, and i think management are really good there they've turned around a bit of a basket case mm. years ago into something that's now very good wouldn't mm. surprise me at all if someone comes in and bids for it so yeah i remain bullish on Reynolds, and, and yeah. it's held up the last two-year bear market it's it's held its own the shares mm. I've done fine. And yeah. I, th yeah, so no, I think it looks very, very good, but you have to be patient with it. Because yeah. Quite often it just grinds along and does nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the one thing I would highlight with investors is, is that if you do that cash flow over interest payments, that is only, it's only 1.8. If you also put in the pension deficit payments, they have to make it. If you put that into the cash flow. Oh, if you it, include the pension. Yes. Yes. It's only 1.8. So there is a bit of leverage in there inherently into that. There is. Sort of, yeah. Into that, into that interest. <laughs> But, the but debt's I mean, all you... quite recent. The debt's all quite recently taken on, though, Paul. It's yeah. not a le sort of legacy debt that they're struggling yeah. to pay down. Yeah. It's um, recently uh, um, acquired debt to mm. make really good acquisitions. Yeah, good. Okay, well, another one in the industrial Zote Phones, which uh, does so well. Oh yes, specialist specialist phones, but it's got that agreement with Nike, and it, and it's also got a sort of like mm. option value with. Uh, I think you mentioned last time. Uh, um, uh, was it Z Force or something like that? Is it Z Z Source? Oh, Resource. Resource. Yes, that's it, yeah. with a Z. Resource. Yeah, resource. yeah no, very nice uh, synopsis there, Paul. That's nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basically a nice each way bet where you get a good quality, profitable, cash generative, and dividend paying business, mm. um, in for a fair price. 
P of something like 1415, which I think is it's it's demonstrated good pricing power throughout the energy crisis in particular. It was able to pass on, um, you know, a, a big spike in the price of its raw materials and energy costs. Yeah. Um, very well run, I think. Nice business. 40 percent of revenue is with Nike. Um, which extended a exclusivity deal, uh, the details of which I'm, I, I don't think are disclosed. Um, they extended that by another six years. So we now know that the, the biggest customer, it looks secure. And who knows, they might, might bid for it. I don't know. Um, they won't, I don't think they'll bid. They won't, they, they're, they're in a brand business. They won't get into Zocphones. But I could see somebody else buying uh, Zocphones for that. Yeah, but you never know if they want to say, you know, block out products from any other suppliers no i'm convinced. sure they've got an exclusivity agreement already probably um and yeah they do but we just don't know the terms of it so anyway i'll forget that idea then but the <laughs> but, but, but the i think free, they're great yeah the free upside is this resource uh yeah. fully recyclable drinks carton mm. which so think of your tetra pack which is a nightmare to recycle in fact in, yeah. in effect it, they all go into landfill because it's got a thin layer of aluminium uh, in between all the other layers, yeah. whereas the resource product, and there must be numerous companies around the world trying to develop a fully mm. recyclable container. Well, uh, Zocfoam seems to be very close to success on it, and it's launching commercial trials in early 2024. Yeah. And it's not going to make the product itself, I don't think, or it's going to license it. And it's already got um, a deal with a large, hasn't disclosed the name, but with a large uh, drinks mm. bottling um <clears throat> And container you know whatever distributor and yeah. manufacturer and the other interesting thing is it doesn't require any change in machinery so all the existing factories that fill these cartons with with drinks don't have to only make very minor changes to use the resource product mm. so the beauty of it is look it's a long shot lots of people are trying to do this um but if it comes off this could be really big and it's in for free so yeah. you're not paying and the other thing is interestingly if it goes wrong Zofoams have already said, well, we'll just abandon it and profits will go up by two million a year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, <laughs> because they're, only they're, on, they're only on 14 times PE. So you get yeah. all that potential upside. Yeah. I, so I, paradoxically, I if, it, if it fails, your PE just got a lot cheaper or dropped about yeah. 12 or something. So I, I love that type of risk reward yeah. where you're getting lots of potentially big upside, but you're getting it for free. Yeah. I could see somebody buying resource actually as well. As a separate, as a yeah, that's, that's a possibility. That's a yeah. possibility. The technology. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, as I say, I've only got a small position currently, but I'm hoping to buy back in properly with a decent size before <laughs> before it announces some world beating thing. So I am. You need to take need to top slice your uh, your plexus at some My point, plexus, probably. Yeah, you're, I'm not ready to do that yet. But you're right. Obviously, like yourself with with. Um, yeah, yeah with equals it's only sensible when you've had you know a, a multi-bagger to, to, to yeah, just trim it back a bit yeah and also to perfectly honest i don't know if you have found it etc because you're i mean you're you're far bigger than me in terms of sort of like you know following on on twitter and well not twitter but you know in social media from investors well but, i don't know about that no no you are <laughs> but when it comes to sort of like um you know stocks if you put if you nail your your, your sort of like a view to you know put your flag in the ground etc then it's sometimes because everybody piles in it can get quite difficult for you to make a you know a decision to sell at all because you you don't yes. want you know and, and and you shouldn't be placed in that position because you've bought it for the right reasons you've held yes. it for the right reasons and if you top slice that's just normal normal but some investors sort absolutely of say, yeah yeah no, i couldn't agree more but i think the where people cross the line sometimes in this we might have mentioned this before is where they'll They'll put loads of really bullish things out about a stock yeah. whilst they're selling. Yes. Now that I think crosses a line. Yeah. I'd you know, agree. I think it's fine to top slice if something yeah. shoots up a bit and to say, look, you know, I intend to top slice, mm. you know, into strength like we all do. But I think you can't then try and sort of, you know, I think with Twitter sometimes yes. you get a bit of that. Um, I think you and I, we're, we're, we're long-term investors. We go, we have yeah. an investment thesis and we'll hold a stock until the investment thesis you typically is, is broken or you find another opportunity. And that yeah. sort of just decides you, or it gets so big that you have to basically top slice. We're not yeah, into this exactly sort of short-term right. stuff, whatever, but, uh, yeah. but it does. I mean, if you've had a bit. Yeah, sorry, come on, Paul. But but even but even with you know we when you get when you get a big home run as you have and I did with equals, then it still gets quite difficult. It puts you in a difficult position to say, it does. say you know because because you you can sort of like psychologically stop yourself and you should be doing the right thing, which is just take some juice off the top. 
I think that's a really good point. And one of the one of the ways that I try and achieve that is even when I'm super keen on a share, I do like to actually finish my post or my article with trying to put some bear points in as well. Mm. So it's like with Plexus, yes, I'm super yeah. keen on it, but I mustn't get too carried away because I mean, you and I both, we get a bit overexcited. Yeah, I know. Anyway. We've been doing this for a long time, <laughs> haven't we? Yeah, but we're passionate about it. It's yeah. one of our you know, big passions in life. So you can sometimes, you do sometimes have to stop yourself and say, well, hang on, I put for balance, I need to put in some bear points. So with Plexus, I always say, look, uh, it will need to raise more money, and it's already said it will, and there was that negative going concern mm. statement. So I think providing you balance the comments up, yeah. then then you know you've got a, a clear conscience in my view I agree yeah yeah now just finally then we've got um, a bit of a category killer in sort of sms payments uh, uh phonics mobile in the uk and it does it for sort of i think it also does for voting for, for things like you know children yes. in need and for competitions probably it's probably having a, bo- a re- booming trade with i'm a celebrity get me out of here when they start <laughs> voting and also strictly whatever it is so it does all of those sms sort of voting and payments do you want to take us through yeah. they've you know, got a strong balance sheet 17 million of cash not a cheap valuation but i guess it's just a big defensible position yeah i just thought i'd throw this one in i don't think we've spoken about it before no we haven't no i don't hold any personally but i remember i spoke to the ceo when it first listed Mm. and thought well this sounds good and it's actually it hasn't really put a foot wrong since it's been listed Mm. and it's a a rarely unusual sort of tech-based company that uh, doesn't really have any capex, so it's all cash flow, and it yeah. pays nearly all of its cash flow out in divvies. Yeah. So you actually get a nice dividend. P tends to be around low twenties mm. or thereabouts, which is a lot. I mean, I wouldn't probably be rushing out to buy them personally, but it's certainly always on my list as as, as a company that's not really putting a foot wrong. Yeah. And what I do like, the customers are incredibly sticky. I think they've said they've never lost a major client. Mm. Um, all these phone-ins and they also do the sort of Richard and Judy type programs, you know, where you, you ring in to win a holiday and they're, they're tremendously yeah. profitable for the, for the TV companies who yeah. never switch because phonics always works. Yeah. They've never had an outage. So there is risk there, you know, if all the computer systems go down, but mm. I, I just think it looks a really nice quality business. And now there is, again, we always look for sort of hidden or not obvious upside, don't we, Paul? And yeah. the international expansion is now on their radar and I, in a way, you go, mm, that's not, I'm not too keen on that. But they've gone into Ireland and they've absolutely nailed it, basically. Yeah. In one year, because they can operate all the IT from the UK, and it's seamlessly gone into Ireland. So they're now looking at other international markets. So yeah. that could be your growth driver. Um, so, again, just an idea. Have a look at it and see what you think. Yeah, no, I agree. OK, good. Well, just before I, we, we end, in terms of looking forward for 2024, in terms of areas that we should avoid or mistakes that we should, you know, should, we should be aware of. I mean, I, I'm guessing, given you and I are pretty bullish, it's, don't be too cautious, you know, because if you did stay in cash, then you're going to miss opportunities. But what are your sort of things that you'd sort of like, you know, advise investors just to sort of like be aware of heading into next year? I think we just have to accept the macro risk. You know, when 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 shares are this cheap, yeah. you know, these are some of the cheapest valuations generally, you know, mm. in small caps and mid caps that we've seen for a long, long time. So that doesn't come unless the, a lot of people are nervous. So I think yeah. for me personally, and everyone's situation is different for me personally, it's just working out what my risk tolerance is and then just accepting. Yeah, I'm going to have some profit warnings. You know, yeah. I don't know which, um, but when you're diversified, I mean, my portfolio is my published watch lists this year have done very very well Mm. and they've absorbed lots of profit warnings so you know when you're diversified you 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 shouldn't be terrified of profit warnings when the macro position's uncertain that's why the shares are so cheap so um and again if people get really that anxious about their investing and losing money on things then it's probably not the right game for them or they're risking too much money yeah. you know so um but everybody's got to work that out for themselves no i'm just i think things are looking good and um for 2024 and i accept the risk you know we'll have yeah. some setbacks we always do yeah 
Well, as I say, big congrats on your fantastic performance. I mean, you, you obviously you didn't, want, you didn't want to disclose your returns, but I know it's a very, very healthy double digit, maybe a triple digit. I don't know, but uh, certainly done. I'm not really... going to be drawn. No, no, no. You've certainly done. You've certainly... I mean, the, a, the AIM index is down, what, 15% still, even though the bank. Yes. So it just shows you, you know, you, you take on a lot of idiosyncratic risk and you have a lot of conviction over your own stocks and uh, things can move. You know, you, if the market goes one way, it doesn't mean your portfolio, you know, get, follows it. You can go the other way. Mm. So, um, yeah, no, yeah. really, really, really well done. And hope you have a great Thank Christmas you. there, Paul. And please, please, for everybody, keep doing your podcasts and your <laughs> value report because everybody gets a lot of benefit. That's for sure. Oh, thanks, Paul. And I mean, again, right back at you, you know, you're putting out wonderful content. Long may it continue. Well, I'll speak to you in about uh, three months time then. Take care. Great. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Bye, everyone.